watch our videos and review your learning with the Crash Course app. Supplemental content is now available for these courses. George Eliot's old grandfather rode a pig home yesterday. Mnemonics are great for trying to remember our fourth grade spelling words. But actually deciding what the word geography means is a bit trickier. Sure, we memorize state and world capitals because everyone's impressed if you can rattle them off, like the capital of Canada, Ottawa. Or we learn that rivers flow downhill, or that the US imports more than 3 billion pounds of bananas from Guatemala each year. And those are cool factoids, but that's not all geography is. Geography helps us answer bigger questions, like what's the story of the Earth? How do humans change their environments? And why, of all places, did that huge mountain form there? There's a lot to cover in this series, because geography encompasses all 4.5 billion years or so of the Earth's history, and even makes predictions about our future. So we're going to do our best to highlight the weirdest, most awe-inspiring parts. I'm Alize Carrere, and welcome to Crash Course Geography. Let's take a closer look at that last factoid I threw out and go a little bananas. It might come in handy at a trivia game to know the volume of the US-Guatemala banana trade, but there must be more to the story. Like why Guatemala and why bananas? In geography, we use those questions to better understand the connections between us and the physical world. So today, let's start in Guatemala. We think of the land now called Guatemala as part of Central America, a region between North and South America that's covered with dense rainforests and incredible biodiversity. To look just at Guatemala, we jump between 13 degrees 45 minutes and 17 degrees 48 minutes north latitude and 88 degrees 14 minutes and 92 degrees 13 minutes west longitude. We could even give the absolute location or geographic coordinates of different geographic points of interest in Guatemala, from Volcan de Fuego to the Mayan ruins in Tikal. From there, we might notice the physical environment, like the climate, the landforms, or the rivers and waterways. Guatemala is a mountainous country with both recently active and long dormant volcanoes that have provided rich, fertile soil. With soil like this, it seems like there's no shortage of options for what would grow, and yet, bananas. It turns out, to be successful, bananas need to grow at a temperature between 20 and 35 degrees Celsius. Guatemala's tropical regions range between 18 and 35 degrees. Bananas need about 170 centimeters of rain a year. Most of Guatemala gets between 70 and 200 centimeters. And bananas need well-drained soils rich in potassium. Guatemala's volcanoes spew rocks rich in iron, magnesium, and, you guessed it, potassium. What we're doing here is identifying the space, or the features and relationships that occur in a given area. Basically, it's the cold, hard facts about a specific location on Earth's surface. We need to pinpoint where we're interested in before we can start to answer why various things happen there. Working with the idea of space is one of the defining characteristics of geography. And we'll get into even more specifics in later episodes. Historically, maps, and more recently satellite images, are tools that help define and quantify space. But there are plenty of non-spatial things we might already have in our minds about Guatemala and Central America. For example, that it's long been home to large populations of indigenous peoples, including Mayan groups like the Quiche, Cachiquel, and Mam, and non-Mayan groups like the Chinca. Or that it's a region known for its history of empires, like the Mayan or those created by Spanish colonizers. Guatemala has been known by many names, including Cuauhtemalan, a name given to the area by clash colon warriors accompanying Spanish conquistadors. Like almost any land or mountain or stretch of sea, Guatemala means different things to different people. It's a place, or somewhere that has attached value, meaning, and emotion to it that can't be measured. It's subjective for sure, but a place can be observed and described to others. We can think of place as the significance attached to a particular space. So as we try to better understand the significance of bananas and how they fit into Guatemala, the space and the place, we'd learn bananas actually aren't native to Guatemala or even the Americas. Explorers and missionaries brought bananas to Central America in the 1500s from the areas near present-day Indonesia and Papua New Guinea where bananas grow natively. Thinking about where bananas can grow in Guatemala and why adds another layer to our geographical investigation. After all, almost one out of every three people in the workforce works in agriculture as of 2020. So the next chapter in the geography of Guatemalan banana imports story is thinking about interactions humans have with the environment. In geography, human-environment interactions are all the ways humans connect with and live within the environment and the impact the environment has on lives, choices, and experiences of people. This is key to geographers. So in Guatemala, where there's enough flat land and fertile soil, and it's not too hot or cold or dry or wet, humans might decide to grow bananas. But that still doesn't tell us how bananas came to be one of the main crops grown in Guatemala, or why there's so much trade in bananas specifically with the US. If we think about demand economics, one answer for why the US imports more than 3 billion pounds of bananas from Guatemala each year is because there are no tariffs or import restrictions, and transportation costs are fairly low. Other banana hotspots like Ecuador, Panama, and India are a bit farther away, so transportation is more expensive. The greater the ocean distance, the higher the price. But that's not the whole story. To this day, the agriculture industry in Guatemala relies on the plantation, 
which is a large-scale commercial enterprise that just produces one crop and mostly exports it. Plantations arrived in Guatemala with European explorers colonizing the Americas. But they can also be found in other parts of the world that experienced colonialism, like cocoa plantations in the West Indies, tea plantations in Sri Lanka, and cotton plantations in the US. No matter where they're located, using plantations has had long-lasting consequences we still contend with today. To peel back the layers, let's go to the thought bubble. Bananas first became popular as a quote, rare and delicious treat in the United States in the late 19th century, even though they'd long been a diet staple in many tropical regions. Sensing an opportunity, American businessmen like Minor C. Keith and Andrew Preston started importing them from around Latin America. The two men were forced to merge their lucrative banana empires in 1899. Tropical Trading and Transport Company in Central America joined with the Boston Fruit Company that dominated the Caribbean, creating the soon to be infamous United Fruit Company. Along with others, it would become so powerful that in 1901, the author O. Henry described countries like Honduras and Guatemala as banana republics, a reference to the vast control the fruit companies wielded over many nations. For example, in 1904, Keith, as vice president of United Fruit, signed an exclusive deal with President Manuel Estrada Cabrera that gave the company tax exemptions, land grants, and control of all railroads on the Atlantic side of Guatemala. By the 1930s, United Fruit was the largest landholder in Guatemala. Across Latin America, they became embroiled in violent disputes, like the 1928 banana massacre in Colombia that was immortalized in Gabriel Garcia Marquez's great novel, 100 Years of Solitude, or the 1934 Great Banana Strike that eventually led to the creation of trade unions in Costa Rica, or in 1954, when they lobbied the US government to stage a coup and depose the Guatemalan president when hoarded United Fruitland was being redistributed, which the US did. They had to be politically involved to keep control. A US-backed military dictatorship didn't actually help their stock value, but such a big and profitable company had connections across the US government and were able to set up agreements that persist in some form or other today, which means that the US still gets most of its bananas from Guatemala. Thanks, Thought Bubble. It might seem like we've confused history for geography, but the sordid past of the banana isn't in the past at all. You might not have heard of United Fruit, but you've probably seen the label in grocery stores or heard of Chiquita Bananas. The United Fruit Company eventually became Chiquita Brands International in 1984, which is still the number one US supplier of bananas today. Basically, banana plantations have had a huge influence on the unequal distribution of land and wealth, leading to peasant uprisings, repressive military regimes, and the growing economic inequalities in Guatemala. Entire books could be written on the last 150 years of banana trade, and they'd read like political thrillers. So with fertile soil, the political power structure, and the rise of colonialism, and Europeans swooping in to create plantations, Bananas have been stamped into Guatemalan history. Wow, all that from just one little factoid about a fruit you can buy in pretty much any corner store across the US. I told you that geography was complicated and every factoid actually has a story behind it. But there are always more questions. Like if we focus on the environment part of human environment interactions, what's the environmental impact of these large plantations? And this is just Guatemala. What about other places in the world where bananas grow? Costa Rica, Panama, and the Dominican Republic. What's the story associated with their banana exports? And that's why just the factoid you learned in fourth grade alone isn't geography. Geography is that factoid and the story that surrounds it. We just looked at the geography of bananas, but we could have done the same thing for chocolate or the Nile River Valley or heat islands in the Chicago area. The earth has so many stories and geography is here to tell them. Clearly the world is complicated, but in geography, we try and look at the big picture the confluence of space, place, and the human environment interactions and how they've overlapped to bring us this far into the story. This is what makes geography a spatial science. It's all about how things vary from place to place and asking why here? No two places are the same, but when we ask questions to learn more about one place, we might just be able to explain what is happening in another place. Of course, geographers are going to make mistakes because we're curious, imperfect, wonderful humans. And there will be so many more moments where we go bananas and realize that what we thought was just a cool fact actually has a huge backstory. There's a whole team working on crash course geography, trying hard to avoid making mistakes. But we also know that when we tell a story, we make certain assumptions, or we have to leave out facts to make sure there's a beginning, middle, and end in a 10 minute video. So as we move through this series and learn together, let's all try and think about the interconnectedness of Earth and its peoples and economies and histories. And the fact that a banana factoid can be way more complicated than we expect. That's what will make us all a little more thoughtful and geographically aware. So what is geography? It's so much more than just identifying cities and countries and capitals on a map. Geographers look to find connections between the physical processes at work on Earth's surface, and under the surface too, and how people use and interact with the Earth. Next time, we'll look at one of the most useful tools that geographers use, maps. Maps tell their own story and can even be made specifically to tell a particular story. More on that next week. 
Many maps and borders represent modern geopolitical divisions that have often been decided without the consultation, permission, or recognition of the land's original inhabitants. Many geographical place names also don't reflect the indigenous or aboriginal people's languages. So we at Crash Course want to acknowledge these people's traditional and ongoing relationship with that land and all the physical and human geographical elements of it. We encourage you to learn about the history of the place you call home through resources like nativelands.ca and by engaging with your local indigenous and aboriginal nations through the websites and resources they provide. Thanks for watching this episode of Crash Course Geography, which was made with the help of all of these nice people. If you'd like to help keep Crash Course free for everyone forever, please consider joining our community on Patreon.